I, I don't know if you guys know it, but we, we just hit a sort of significant landmark here because 2023 is the 40th anniversary of uh, the release of John Cougar Mellencamp's Authority song <laughs> that uh, said, I fight authority, authority always wins. You know, there's something, something about that line that uh, captures something very American, I think, you know. I mean, it goes way back for, for us as a people, you know, even, even before the Revolutionary War, you think about those pilgrims coming over to get out from under the authority of the church over there in England, and then, and then of course, the, the Tea Party and all that, that happened Johnny Tremaine and you know we've just ever since kind of kind of chafed under authority right a little bit um, I, I did a sort of informal poll in our small group this week talking about authority and kind of do you see the word as positive or negative and it's kind of a, a mixed response I'm curious for you is, is authority a positive or negative word what, do you, what comes to mind for you when you think of authority? Both. Yeah, yeah it's kind of both, right? <laughs> um, and yet, and yet we, we don't like the absence of authority really either. The, the chaos of the last three plus years, you know, where it feels like we would really like to be able to appeal to an authority to address some of the things that concern us. And uh, the New York Times ran an article last year with this graphic and headline that said, a nation on hold wants to speak with a manager. They were trying to capture the, the frustration that they just were seeing everywhere you go. They used a story about this, this man who went into this grocery store in Minnesota and he's asking about this exotic brand of blue cheese that was imported and they, it's Minnesota and they didn't have it there, you know, and he sends the clerk to the back to look it up and she can't find it anywhere and, and here he is, he's this 60 something year old man throwing a full blown temper tantrum in the dairy aisle and she's watching this and she's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at him and I'm going, I don't think this is really about cheese. <laughs> and it's not, it's not about the cheese, right? We're, we're, we're concerned when, when we uh, can't seem to find authority that is responsive to us. And, and I think especially right now, I mean, Claire alluded to a little bit of the sense that we have of feeling like the world is kind of falling apart and we see leadership either being sometimes inept or corrupt or non-responsive. And so we can have that sense of, psychologists call it moral distress, where we're concerned about things, but it feels like we don't have anywhere to go with it. And it feels like we don't know what to do with that. And so all of that, uh, as, I'm, as I'm reading this passage that we're going to look at today, and the word authority comes up a couple times in it, and it just was interesting to think about Jesus in relationship to authority and our relationship to him and thinking about authority and what's different about him in that, in that role. And so I want to dive into it with you. We're going to pick up right where we left off two weeks ago, I should have just called this study a study of Mark chapter one because it feels like we can't seem to get past the first chapter, but there's just so much good stuff in it. Um, eventually, we will, we will be past it, but um, we're going to pick up in verse 21, and, and here's what it says. This is right after Jesus had called his first disciples, and so... They went to Capernaum, it's Jesus and these first disciples, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. Now, just a little bit of a geographical reference point for you here. If you go to Capernaum today, there is the ruins of a synagogue there that you can find and visit, 
Uh, they, they believe this synagogue was actually built about 300 years after Jesus, but they found the remains of the, the previous synagogue underneath this one. So this is highly likely that this is the very exact spot of land where Jesus uh, was teaching. And uh, I, I love that when you can actually take Bible stories and, and see their, where they're actually grounded in real places, because um, it's not just characters that we're reading about in the Bible. It really actually happened in a real spot. So you can kind of picture Jesus in, in this place here, and he's teaching. And as he began to teach, the people were amazed at his teaching. That word there is really, it's, they were jaw-droppingly astonished. They were floored by his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. There's, there's that word for us right there, authority, not as the teachers of the law. Now, this is kind of interesting because I feel like every time you meet the teachers of the law in the New Testament, it feels like they're they're acting like they have authority, right? They're very bossy. They, they're very authoritative. They seem to really want people to listen to them and do what they're saying. So it feels like they think they have authority. In fact, Jesus actually even addressed them about this and kind of called them out on it when he said, and you, you experts in the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. So they obviously saw themselves as being able to tell people what to do. And they, and they were, um, you know, they, they knew stuff. They were experts. They were, they were smart people who studied hard and worked really hard at, at knowing the law really well. Uh, but I like what... Akeem Nowak said, he said, confidence does not shout. Jesus didn't have to strive for authority. He didn't have to try to prove that that's what he was. In fact, the, the word there that's used for authority in the Greek is exousia, which comes from two Greek words, which means out of and being. And it's like this authority that Christ had came right out of who he was, his personhood. It was inherent in him. It just, it just was there because he was there. And so it was a totally different kind of authority. It wasn't like Jesus was trying to prove he knew more or was smarter or more meticulous than, than the teachers of the law. It just, it just flowed out of him that this was a different kind of of authority. Uh, back in the 1970s when the first Star Wars movie came out, this, by the way, is not a scene from the actual movie. This is a recreation <laughs> here, but that's my, my cousin Dave on your right there in the white. He's Luke Skywalker, and my other cousin Greg is in the blue, and he's Obi-Wan. That's me in the middle, uh, that's uh, C-3PO, in case you weren't able to identify who that is. Um, and that's my little brother, Jordan, there, who is sort of a humanized version of R2-D2. Uh, so my little brother was obsessed with Star Wars. He absolutely loved it. He was five years old when it came out, and he... If he cornered you in a conversation, he would walk through the entire plot of the movie with you and give you great detail about everything that happened in it. But here's the thing. The Peabody children were not allowed to see PG movies. We didn't get to see Star Wars in the theater. My brother had never seen the movie. He just had gleaned all this information about it and assembled it in his mind. And so he could talk about it as if he's this expert about it. But he really didn't know anything. And, 
you know, you picture, you picture the difference between his understanding of the movie and George Lucas coming in, or, or maybe if there were a real Luke Skywalker who had been out in space and experienced these battles, coming and talking about that experience, the difference in the level of authority on this subject matter. That's kind of what we're talking about uh, with Jesus here, that it just was so dramatically different than what they were used to hearing in, in the explanation of the law. So Jesus is up there and he's, he's talking about, he's, he's, he's teaching the people. And in the middle of his teaching, here's what happens. It says, just then, and again, that's that word immediately that we've been seeing all through the book of Mark so far, that he just keeps throwing that in there. Immediately, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed, again, so just completely astonished by this, that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. Again, back to authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Now, this story is not exactly one that we, we look at and we just feel like we connect with it so immediately, right? There's so many things about it. It's this different context and thousands of years ago in this other part of the world in a synagogue that we've never been to. And, and, and not only that, but then there's this element of these impure spirits, evil spirits, that they're talking about. That's not the language we really use much in America and this kind of this exorcism that's going on. It feels weird and we're, we're not sure what's, what's happening there. But I think, I think there's a lot less of a gap between what's happening here and what's happening in our lives than we might think. I think, I think it's a lot closer. And, and I know I've been referring to language a lot this morning, but I think it's really helpful to, to look at something here because this word for, for these impure spirits, the word impure there can really mean the wrong mix. It's the wrong mix. Like you, you, you sprinkle something in, something that it, it gets contaminated with it, and suddenly you've got the, the wrong mix. So, if you, if you were to dump just one car's worth of used oil uh, into, the, into the water, like just one gallon of used oil can contaminate a million gallons of fresh water. Like that's how far it, it, it spreads and, and mixes in with things. And, and you think about this this mix and how Jesus talked about how sin can be like that and how a, a little bit of yeast works through the whole dough, right? And, and there is this sense in which we can, we can have things that are the wrong mix in our lives that maybe we don't refer to them as spirits. Maybe we use the word attitude, you know? Uh, but it's, it's really, if just because we've depersonified it doesn't mean it's not the same thing. And I'm curious, as you think about it, what makes for a wrong mix? Like, what is, what is an attitude that kind of pervades things when it gets into, well, what you've seen in other people, anyway? <laughs> uh, any, any thoughts of anything that comes to mind? Blame. Blame? Blame. Negativity. Negativity, defensiveness. bitterness, defensiveness, entitlement. entitlement, yes. All these things just kind of work their way in and, and they can fill the bowl, you know. And, and the thing about any of these, and sometimes we even use the word spirit around them, you know, a bitter spirit or distrustful spirit or fear and pride and resentment. Manipulation, you can go down this whole list of all these things and more that, that just kind of 
affect everything about our outlook, right? And so it doesn't take very much of any one of these to affect everything. It, it just gets in there and it's swirled around and it just is, is in the fabric of our, our being and it becomes the wrong mix. The good news is that Christ's authority, when Christ comes along, Christ's authority unmixes us. And I think people were so astonished when they see Jesus doing this thing because do you know how hard it is to unmix something? <laughs> like once it's been all blended together to try to extract it, that's, I mean, James, maybe you have some fancy equipment in your laboratory that can kind of like pull stuff out and extract it. But, but I think most of the time it's really hard to undo what's been done. And so when they see Jesus being able to to take this spirit out of, the con- out of the conversation, it's a really difficult thing to do that he's, he's making happen here. And Christ, Christ can do that. And, and I would say his authority extends places we can't see or necessarily sort out. Because I think about this man in this synagogue, and I go, I don't know that day. I'm, I'm imagining this, but I don't think probably most people in the room knew that that man had an impure spirit that he was dealing with. I don't know that they would have let him into the synagogue had they known that ahead of time. It's, it's there, and they can't really see it. They're, they're dealing with it, but, but Christ sees it, and, and the spirit recognizes Christ. Um, and so he's dealing with it, and it's something that, you know, I think it's difficult for us to sometimes sort out what the spiritual thing is. We can't really see it, but it, Christ can see it, and Christ can sort it out, and he can, he can address it even before we recognize what's going on in our own lives. We might recognize that there's something mixed up that we, we can kind of feel a little bit off, or we know that something isn't quite right, but maybe we don't fully know what we're dealing with ourselves. But it doesn't matter because Christ does. Christ sees it, and he knows, and he can, he can speak to it, and he can unmix us even when, even when we uh, don't see it. And, you know, um, the, the good news is that because the spirits can see Jesus and recognize who he is, they have no choice but to obey when he commands them. Like, even when I don't get it, uh, they, they do get it. They know who he is, and they don't have a choice in the matter. Um, and it's not always the same. I, you know, it's last night, I will just say, I don't know how many times Saturday night is often when I have the, the biggest battles with anxiety. Um, and so I'm lying in bed and I'm going, I can, and it's, it's, it's one of those things where like when I start to think, oh, here it comes, that then it, then it kicks in the physical element to it and I'm anxious about being anxious. And, and so it's sort of this self-fulfilling thing. Some of you understand that. Um, but I'm going, okay. Here I'm dealing with this, right before I'm going to preach about this. What an opportunity for me to learn something. See if this, to test it, you know. And, and, and it wasn't, it was more going, oh, I don't, here I am saying, I'm saying so confidently that, that these things respond to Christ's authority and his presence. And I'm going, man, and I'm still dealing with this anxiety here. What's that? What's that about? Uh, and I just... I was able to have this, this moment of inviting Christ to speak to it in a different way, picturing him there like this, like this scene. And uh, it wasn't anything dramatic. And actually, then I ended up asking, uh, sharing with Karin what was going on. She prayed for me. And, and he did, he did, he did uh, take out that, that spirit of anxiety that was, 
was in me. But so often when I have prayed that, that hasn't been the result. It hasn't felt like he has given a word and, and banished it. And I was thinking about that and going, you know, the, the results aren't always the same as this story. Just because Jesus did this this once, not necessarily how he always operates. But the thing is, still, every spirit has to respond to the authority of Christ and what he is speaking. And if he says it's you know, if he, if he allows something to be, this is back to Paul and his thorn in the flesh. When, when he saw that thorn as a messenger of Satan and he prayed for it to go and it didn't, God didn't release him of it, then it transformed it into something else and it didn't require that spirit to be gone. That spirit still had to respond to the authority of Christ. And that's the thing, even when I can't sort out what it's supposed to do, even when it feels to me like the best thing in the world would be for that anxiety to just be gone, and it's not, that I can still know that Christ is still the authority over every power in the world. And, and where I'm wrestling with his authority, spiritual beings, there's no wrestling there. They, they must respond to him, whatever, whatever, he's, uh, whatever he's saying. And so that's comforting to me that that uh, it extend that that his authority extends places that that I can't see or sort out, and also I would say that his authority quiets the voices that say God is against us, because that's what that spirit was saying in the moment. It wasn't just saying I know who you are, you're the Son of God. It was saying, if you come to destroy us, and and. You know, again, this spirit may be speaking for the spiritual world. Have you come to destroy us? But, but he's speaking through a human being. He's speaking through this man's voice. And the way everybody in the room would hear it would be, have you come to destroy us people? You know, he's talking about the kingdom of God arriving, which associates with judgment in people's minds. And so they can, they can imagine that Christ's purpose in coming to them was to get them, to, to punish them. And yet Christ's very presence is the opposite of that. It's the, the arrival of good news and salvation. And so when these voices want to transform the good news into bad news in our minds, Christ speaks against that. I like what J.B. Phillips said. He said, we shall never want to serve God in our real and secret hearts if he looms in our subconscious mind as an arbitrary dictator or spoil sport or as one who takes advantage of his position to make us poor mortals feel guilty and afraid. If that's who we think God is, it's going to be awfully hard to serve him. And Christ's authority, Christ's very presence in this place speaks to that not being who God is because he's the one God sent to save us out of his love for us. That's the whole reason he's here. And Paul talked about this in Romans when he said, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Like how could we, how could we think God is out to get us when we have Jesus? That's the authority of Christ quieting that voice. And so often we do have that voice. We come up against circumstances that we go, maybe God isn't good. Maybe God doesn't see me. Maybe God doesn't care about me. And, and Christ is the one who calls us back to look at him and remember again his presence with us and what that means. And then, and then I would say that Christ's authority always results in the further spread of God's glory. Because look what happened at the end of the story where they, they went out and the news about him spread everywhere in the region, right? Because when, when everything Christ did was to bring glory to his father. And I think this is so remarkable in this situation, especially because here's this spirit whose sole purpose in that meeting is disruption, to derail what Jesus is teaching this great lesson and suddenly it's thrown off by this interruption as this, this voice breaks in and it's, it's undermining his credibility and, and all of this and trying very much to, to just take him out. And yet that becomes the very thing that 
propels the message of the gospel further out into the world to the glory of God. And so Christ's authority can take all these things and speak to them and flip them around. Uh, And I find that also just so comforting and heartening. I've been talking for a long time. Any, Any thoughts on any of those points? Yeah, Dean. Your anxiety on Saturday night occurring only when you're preaching the next day or if you're not preaching the next day doesn't exist. Uh, that is a good question. I, I haven't actually tallied it up, but most of the time I would say, I would say I'm preaching the next morning. Would you say that's... I mean, most Sundays I am preaching, so it's hard to tell, but I... Um, yeah, it's it's definitely le- it's definitely there's there's an association there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I have too many thoughts, and I will spare you all. <laughs> <laughs> Get them out before we go. I mean, I could not, I was such a know-it-all, I could not deal with authority gods or anyone's because of my own woundedness. And Monty and I just got back from a trip to Europe. And it's so cool to have markers where you can be like, wow, I actually am seeing the fruitfulness of the salvation and deliverance of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he delivers us and we're new. The second, immediately, we're delivered. But then we have to walk it out. Mm-hmm. And in Philippians it says, so it makes me think of this, uh, so keep working at your salvation with fear and trembling mm-hmm. and just hit me in a new way. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't say to do it if we weren't going to be afraid and trembly and mm-hmm. anxious. Yeah. We are to work out our salvation because mm-hmm. it's God that's at work within us to work in the world at His good pleasure. And I'm just blown away by the fact that even as you were saying, Jeff, like sometimes you pray and the name of Jesus is over that anxiety, but you don't feel that external mm. result. Yeah. But as we keep walking, we feel it more and more. Yeah. And I'm so full of joy and relief because I am not perfect yet. Well, I'm perfect right now in Christ, but I will continue to walk it out. But I'm starting to feel the mm. tremendous joy and relief that I really know who Jesus is, his mm. burden. And I don't know about you guys, but I have been so stinking burdened in my life mm-hmm. by so many things, my mm-hmm. OCD, my anxiety, uh, control, fear, caretaking, people pleasing, managing my children, managing my marriage, things that Jesus says, come and be yoked. Mm-hmm. My burden's easy and light. Do I always feel that way? No. Mm-hmm. And it's so cool to be seen in increasing measure that immediately in Jesus' deliverance, mm-hmm. I'm feeling it. And so, yeah, I can say way more, like yeah. I said, and Monty, I will not. <laughs> I'm just so grateful. Mm-hmm. It's miraculous. Mm-hmm. I said to Monty this morning, it's a long, slow miracle. Yeah. But I know it's a miracle. It mm-hmm. hasn't been an immediately miracle that's taken a stinking long time for this 54-year-old woman to be receiving an increasing measure. But mm-hmm. I'm just so thankful. So yes. that's it. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. That's really good. I love that. Yeah. Um, Something I've been struck by as I've been reading a normal human space through the book of Mark. Uh (laughs) 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 The point here is that Jesus delights when people recognize yeah. And you see that everywhere in this whole book. You see when, when someone comes to Jesus and says, You have no authority. Yeah. There's this delight. Yeah. And mm. there's something here in this part of the story, it's like just the demons who are really getting it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but as time goes along, just to see how, like, yeah, there's something about us recognizing our yeah. authority that he just is drawn to. Like, no matter where people are coming from or when they believe. Yeah. Yeah. Which is which is really encouraging for us uh, in in acknowledging 
that authority that, um, that that's what awaits us in the kind of authority that he is. Yeah, Rich, you were going to say something. So along those lines, one little part of this of that passage that kind of came to my mind was, so the man walked into the synagogue and he had this spirit. What would have happened if the spirit hadn't have expressed itself in mm. Jesus? Mm. Would Jesus have found him? Mm. I don't know. Yeah. I think it took the spirit to express itself and make itself known. Mm. Mm to elicit the response. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, I, I kind of also wonder, it, it seems like if you look at several situations through scripture, it almost feels like the spirits don't have a, a choice but to respond to Christ. Like, they can't, they can't be in the same room with him very long without manifesting themselves. And, and um, yeah, so they kind of, but that's an interest. That's a really interesting thought, you know, that it took that that revelation. Yeah. Well, and like how much? I mean, I. Anyway, like how much would we look at like spirits, like more like just our things that we're dealing with, like we were talking about earlier. Like, how much do we miss out on healing when we keep it hidden? Yeah, 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 right. Well, and that, that actually leads us to my, my final point here, which is that Christ's authority restores our vulnerability. Um, you know, the, this man, the, the, the response of that spirit that the man had to Jesus is putting up this defense against him, right? Because like, you've, you've come to destroy, destroy us, and, and it like puts some distance between them. And Jesus takes away that, the cause of the distance. Um, Ron Heifetz is a, a faculty member in the Harvard Business School. He's taught there for a long time. And years ago, he, he wrote a book with another man named Marty Linsky, and, and in the book, he tells the story of going to Oxford. He was giving a lecture there. And he and his wife were driving uh, up, to Ox, or up to London afterwards. They're Jewish, and they were, they were seeking out a, a synagogue because it was Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year. And so they wanted to celebrate with the Jewish community. So they're, they're on their way. But then they, they stopped in this little this little town of Castlecombe in England, and um, and decided to stay there instead. And they they went next door to the the place they were staying was right next door to this old old Anglican church. And they walked in, and you know, Ron uh, had really these conflicted feelings about being in the building because he he really had carried he said for for decades this sort of smoldering outrage against all the abuses of christianity over the over the centuries and you know the history there and so he 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 walked in though and he sat down in the front row and he's looking at this image of christ on the cross up in front and and as he's looking at this, uh, it struck him that Jesus, being Jewish, would have celebrated Rosh Hashanah back when he was on earth. And, and he was like, you know, you were one of our teachers. We might as well celebrate the new year together since there's nobody here to celebrate it with us. And so he sat there and he was meditating on, on Jesus on the cross there and and he starts this conversation with Jesus, and he says, Reb Jesus, Reb being the, the uh, affectionate term for rabbi, he says, Reb Jesus, would you show me your experience of the cross? He said, you know, Rosh Hashanah is when we contemplate Abraham being willing to sacrifice his son. Do you have a message for me? And he sat there for about 10 minutes and then he got really excited. 
And he got up and he grabbed his wife's hand and he took her outside and he said, I want to share something with you, but I can't tell you, I need to show you. And, and so he had her lay down in the grass next to him, looking up at this big pine tree. And he said, stretch your, stretch your arms out like this. And so they're laying there on the ground in this pose like Jesus on the cross. And they laid there for a minute and he turns to her and he says, how do you feel? And she said, really vulnerable. And he said, that's it. That's the message that, that Christ stepped into our vulnerability, that this is how he chose to use his authority to not come down off the cross when he could have, but to stay there in that moment of dread when he's crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then in the next moment saying, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And, and to, to use his authority that way, to stay there all the way to the end, that means we can, we can trust him because he understands what it's like to be vulnerable. And he's always the same, yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. He never will leave us. He never will break his promises. We can, we can trust that. He, he already knows the very, very worst about us, and he loves us anyway, and he wants are good. We can trust that he came for our good out of love. Uh, And there's nothing wrong in the mix of his authority. It's absolutely trustworthy. And as we come to a close this morning, I want to do something a little bit different. Uh, I want to just close with a time of prayer. I'm going to put back up for a second this, this mix of things. And first off, I just want to give you a moment to to pray silently to the Lord about whatever you feel like might be in the mix for you right now that you would like to bring to to have his authority speak to. Would you just take a moment, um, meditate on, on one of those words from the screen that feels like it's It's something that you're dealing with right now and just offer it to the Lord. And then as we are thinking about situations in our lives, or in the world where we are wanting to see Christ's authority have impact. I'm wondering if just a couple people could, could say a sentence prayer out loud, just inviting Christ to unmix the situation, to speak into it, to quiet the voices and to to bring glory to God in the midst of it. Could could just a few of you um, pray what's on your heart this morning? Thank you for the soft and hard parts. Jesus, ask for help in exchanging a spirit of despair for a spirit of hope. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Help us see the image of 
of God in each other. Mm -hmm. Lord Jesus, we are so conflicted when it comes to thinking about authority and trust and control and power, and, and yet we very much need your absolutely trustworthy authority to come to bear in our lives. There are so many situations where we resist it and, and desperately, desperately need it. And so I, I pray for greater courage to be vulnerable with you, to, to admit the need more easily, because we are mixed up. God, we do have just so many things swirling in our minds and hearts and we want to be sorted out. We we want to uh, we want to have you clean us up, Lord. Uh, we we want to have those voices that are so loud fall silent. Would you would you quiet us? Um, draw us more and more to yourself, Lord. Show us yet again that that you are never changing, that your word never changes, that your promises never fail, and uh, that you are the only one that, that is fully worthy of our faith. And uh, we thank you for your faithfulness and your love. Amen.